pass the floor to our last speaker, Dr. Chichi Nan. Thank you, Dr. Pimrapat. Uh, I want to talk about three things. First, uh, the pity in, in Asia that this is a, a window of opportunity, a time where it is ripe, uh, opportune for, for more cooperation, for regionalism, for regional integration in Asia. But in fact, uh, we are going to see most likely the opposite direction, more tensions, uh, turbulence, and turmoil. And uh, I want to also bring up the article uh, in, from 1993. Aaron Friedberg wrote an article called Ripe for Rivalry. Ripe for Rivalry. This is uh, 20 years ago. And uh, at that time, it was not uh, taken, uh, uh, not accepted widely in, in, in Asia. But now I think that uh, he's been somewhat vindicated. So first, I'll look at the uh, the situation that we have at hand now. In the last few years, things have heated up rather quickly uh, in in East Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, some of the previous uh, speakers have already uh, addressed this. The protests in the, all three countries in Northeast Asia, in China, in Japan, there are some protests uh, in South Korea, a very provocative uh, visit by President Lee on the, on the Dokdo Island. But it's a pity because now if you look at the other dynamics at play, after 20 years, uh, this region, this region, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, has a lot going for it. Uh, if you look at the, the Cold War, we went through the Cold War quietly, uh, developing these economies in, in Asia with the export-led model. Uh, after the Cold War, there were regional schemes that came into being. APEC in 1989, uh, the ASEAN Free Trade Area in 1992, uh, ARF in 1994, uh, and beyond that, uh, you know, there are other acronyms that I could mention leading to eventually the East Asia Summit, uh, the ADMM, uh, ASEAN, ASEAN Defense uh, Ministers' meetings. So the regionalism in, in the region, in Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, actually has expanded and made, uh, made much headway. Uh, on the other hand, the economic dynamism uh, in, in the region. This is a fast growing region, the fastest growing, uh, especially these days with the problems in, uh, in Europe and in the US. Uh, it has uh, given rise to books and articles about the Asian century, Asian century. So the rise of Asia, the age of Asia, the Asian century. Uh, I, I don't think we will, seeing, we will see titles uh, like the Asian century or uh, the uh, hoopla, uh, the um, uh, on, on the future of Asia in this century as much because of the tension that we're seeing. Also at that time, China ASEAN relations were not bad. Uh, after 1995, you know, they had a charm offensive from China. Uh, it looked like uh, things were going to, uh, to be peaceful. Uh, in 2002, uh, they began to have negotiations for a uh, code of conduct for the South China Sea. So the, the regional environment, until very recently, until the last three years, uh, was rather conducive for, for more cooperation, for, for regional integration. Uh, of course, we also have um, the ASEAN culmination of the ASEAN cooperation into the ASEAN community 2015. Uh, so you, you can see all this uh, various vehicles and regionalization efforts, uh, particularly the ASEAN Plus Three in 1997. You know, we had a crisis in 1997, and uh, the, in response to the crisis, the ASEAN Plus South Korea, Japan, uh, and China form a, a regional financial vehicle, the ASEAN Plus Three, which has mean, uh, which has which came out with the Chiang Mai Initiative, uh, CMI, which has been expanded now to a, a big uh, fund of $240 billion. Uh, now, along the way, uh, up to the last couple of years, last two or three years, things were looking good for the region. Things were looking good for, for Asia. 
but now I think that uh, we have a case of uh, growing rivalries. Uh, we have now interlocking what I see um, and is uh, consonant with Professor Coker's uh, broad sweeping uh, presentation. Uh, there are now security dilemmas that are interlocked uh, between the different countries. The, the Chinese see the American rebalance as strategic um, encirclement, containment. Uh, the, the Americans, uh, they have to rebalance to protect and promote uh, uh, their interests in, in this region. This is a fast-growing region. The Asia-Pacific will be the, uh, the most dynamic region uh, in, in the world economy for, for many years to come. So the rebalancing of the U.S. is understandable. The Chinese uh, perception of strategic encirclement is understandable. And then you have the, um, the ASEAN uh, approaches and, and reactions to this uh, different mix uh, and posturing of the great powers. So the Philippines has uh, become uh, much more assertive. Without the rebalancing, perhaps the Philippines would not have been uh, so insistent on including the South China Sea in the joint communique in Phnom Penh. Uh, the so-called Phnom Penh incident. And perhaps uh, the Vietnamese would not have been so uh, reliant uh, or so insistent as well to, to include uh, the EEZ in the joint communique. So now you have this interlocking security dilemmas for the different countries in the region that, ha that have uh, undermined two decades of progress on, on regionalism on economic cooperation, on economic integration, uh, going back especially to the Chiang Mai initiative. Uh, and here I think that the trend is not good. Uh, the, the logic uh, of tension uh, and conflict has taken on uh, elements of self-fulfillment. Now the, um, the, the U.S. is going to, uh, uh, to become more in engaged. Uh, the Chinese will become more uh, assertive, aggressive, if not uh, belligerent. And sometimes we think, uh, we might ask, when did this happen? When, when the, the progress uh, for almost two decades, when did it stop when the, uh, the situation, the environment turned sour? And I think it's about 2009. 2009, the, the Vietnamese, uh, the Malaysians, they filed a, uh, a motion uh, to have the continental shelf extension as part of the EZ. Also, the, the 2009 uh, was when, not the first time, but it seemed uh, to come from that that period that the Chinese started using this map, this controversial map, uh, with the uh, you know the whole pretty much almost all of South China Sea within its domain. Uh, since then, th the situation in the neighborhood has really uh, deteriorated, deteriorated. The, uh, the latest Phnom Penh incident uh, is going to be the uh, daunting challenge now of, of ASEAN, whether it can uh, close ranks in time and what will happen to, uh, in November when we have the East Asia Summit, especially if uh, President Obama comes, uh, because it will be right after the election. I'm not sure if he uh, will come stop by Thailand or not, uh, it's a little bit unpredictable with U.S. Uh, elections. Uh, if he wins, then presumably he will come. If he doesn't, if he loses, um, perhaps there's a possibility that uh, he may not he may not attend. Um, so this is something that ASEAN has to fix, but it doesn't look good because next year um, the chair will be Brunei. The chair will be Brunei, and the year after that, the chair will be Myanmar. And the chairmanship of ASEAN has a lot of leverage uh, in setting the agenda, um, controlling uh, what's included in the various uh, joint statements and so on. Uh, a lot of politics will take place. Indonesia will try to, of course, mend fences and promote uh, unity within. But uh, there's a problematic, I think it's problematic now what happens uh, to ASEAN. And it's ironic because ASEAN now has a plan to become a, its own kind of community uh, in by 2015. And there has been uh, just unprecedented uh, awareness programs, seminars and workshops, all kinds of uh, uh, 
publicity and campaigns in, in Thailand and other ASEAN capitals to learn more about the ASEAN community in preparation for 2015. What I think is most disconcerting is the domestic politics now that is taking place in the different countries. In China, uh, they have a leadership transition. Uh, Xi Jinping is going to take over, it's been agreed, and that will take place by March next year. But along the way, uh, the Chinese leadership will not want to appear weak. They will not want to appear weak. So you, we, we cannot, uh, uh, I don't think it's uh, going to be forthcoming that the Chinese leadership will take a softer stance on the South China Sea. The U.S. presidential election, much of it is rhetorical, but the rhetoric adds fuel to the fire, fuel to the uh, the tension, because uh, you know a Republican Obama cannot, President Obama cannot appear weak as well. So there has to be some tough talking from the Democrat Party as well, the Democratic Party, and then the Republican Party, um, you know, sometimes sound mad. Uh, about uh, their positions, and uh, uh, I just learned today that Elliot Cohen, my former professor, may become the NSA if Romney wins. Uh, and that that uh, you know I'm happy because he's you know former teacher, but that worries me because uh, he's very hawkish, uh, a lot of hawks in uh, in the Beltway, uh, who will push uh, China even harder. So the domestic politics in China, and in China, is an opaque system. We don't fully know what's going on behind the scenes. This whole Bo Jilai uh, affair is really revealing. Uh, it, it suggests that some it's, things are very nasty inside uh, the Central Committee, inside the Politburo, and they will have to come out with uh, you know new members, nine members. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, jockeying and a lot of power plays, I suspect, behind the scenes. So China will be, continue to be, uh, aggressive and assertive. It has claims, and the claims on the South China Sea, we have to remember that it depends on which period of history we start. If you go back far enough, the Chinese has some legitimate claims. Uh, but if you go back uh, to the more recent periods, a number of countries have claims. Certainly, we would want to stick by the rules, uh, unclosed UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, but then the U.S. has not signed that. The Chinese doesn't put much currency in that. Uh, so there's a problem because uh, there, there are no rules, um, there, there, there are no effective institutions to govern this ongoing regional tension uh, in the South China Sea. And I think we might also see it uh, in, in a in a along the Mekong area as well uh, in the coming coming years. Domestic politics for me, and then there's a political economy challenge. Uh, the U.S. is driven by a very strong uh, defense uh, industry, uh, the military-industrial complex. And the U.S., even though it's cutting the defense budget uh, slightly, is actually building new weapon systems. Uh, the U.S. is always very strong on defense. It spends more on defense than the next nine countries combined. The Chinese are going to spend more on defense, just as a function of economic growth. And we see already that uh, they have been expanding their defense spending. Uh, the U.S. makes a lot of uh, news about this, uh, a lot of alarm, but in fact still very small compared to um, the, the American defense budget. Nevertheless, uh, there are a lot of people employed uh, in defense industries in all states of America. Uh, there's that driver uh, as well, the, the, the uh, defense spending, the, the budgets. Economic interests have uh, become uh, more dynamic. If you look at the South China Sea, what is the big deal about South China Sea? It's actually become not just a sea now, it's, it's almost uh, in some ways like a pawn because of the dense traffic that goes through it now. Um, so uh, the sea lanes are becoming crowded. Uh, in addition, the resources, there's a battle for resources, and uh, China needs more than, than most. They'll have a lot of people. They need energy resources. Uh, and now we're running out of uh, natural gas 
in in this neighborhood in the Gulf of Thailand so on so the South China Sea is going to be the new uh, haven for for energy exploration to energy resources so we will see more uh, activity more more competition and rivalry over the South South China Sea certainly and I think that there will be more tension to, uh, we are trapped in history of uh, you know the historical baggage from World War II, from before, which is uh, is a pity because uh, Asia has really come a long way. Uh, what what needs to happen next? Well, for for ASEAN, uh, the, the South China Sea uh, is now a uh, sticking point. It is a is a daunting problem. They have to somehow address this and uh, the Philippines have to step back a little bit. I think the Philippines overplayed his hand uh, in Phnom Penh and the Vietnamese also have to step back a little bit. Uh, all have to step back uh, and in the US uh, uh, as well. The Chinese difficult to interpret uh, their intentions but uh, so far very very aggressive. Uh, this is a time where I think ASEAN unity, the ASEAN centrality uh, is being tested uh, more severely uh, in the last couple of decades. This is a year that uh, doesn't look good for ASEAN and it's ironic because now it wants to be a community. So the next couple of years, unless ASEAN can, can really close ranks and, and regain its footing and rebuild a new momentum, it's going to be a big problem for, for the whole organization. And that will have spillover effects for the ASEAN, various ASEAN vehicles, the Plus Three, the East Asia Summit, and so on. Uh, this November will be the key. We'll have to see how uh, Cambodia handles November uh, when they have this uh, summit and the various other sideline meetings. Uh, if November turns out to be like July, which means uh, more acrimony and more tension, then uh, uh, ASEAN's future itself will come into question. On that note, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Titinan, for your uh, interesting presentation um, from international relations perspective. Um, before I open the floor for questions, I would like to invite uh, Professor Coker um, for a short reflection because all the three speakers have referred to your lecture earlier. Please. I'll try to be brief to speak for seven minutes. Um, f fascinating uh, contributions. Uh, let me start with the ASEAN. Uh, we in Europe uh, often think that ASEAN might develop along the lines of, of, of the European uh, Union. Perhaps the European Union is not an ideal model to cite these days, given its troubles. But the point about such organizations is that they do provide over time consensus. And they, they, they tend to not eliminate, but they tend to marginalize uh, the ways in which uh, countries, if you're relying on bilateral relationships rather than multilateral relationships, tend to narrow the debate, uh, anchor the debate in their own historical narratives, provide, uh, provide narrative coherence, which means storytelling. And uh, as you just said, uh, storytelling, unfortunately, back to the Second World War, uh, is still a, a bugbear in a way that it's not in Europe. Uh, I think if ASEAN were to develop into a community, uh, rather than just a talking shop, then it would produce greater habits of cooperation, not consensus, or a new set of values, but ways of uh, working with each other multilaterally, going beyond the multipolar idea, which ASEAN is the mo at the moment, into a multilateral future. Now, that may be a European or Western phenomenon, which is not easily exported uh, or is indeed even relevant in a non-Western setting. But I think we would be disappointed if ASEAN developed in the way that you yourself uh, suggested. There is a school uh, in sociology called sociological institutionalism which shows how over time institutions shape the way people uh, perceive the world and actually create values, uh, values that emerge from institutional cooperation. But on the basis of what you said, none of this is going to happen. And if that doesn't happen, then we go back to 19th century power politics in the region. Uh, back to Bismarckian politics, one might almost say, and that, I think, would be a recipe for conflict, uh, as it was in 19th century Europe. On the question of uh, I, I, 
was very much agreed with what you had to say uh, about the neoconservatives in Romney. And I thought perhaps when I was giving my talk that this was a very Western talk in the sense that Westerners love to heighten up confrontations. This is the way that we negotiate. We heighten up a confrontation. Uh, we call a spade a spade in the hope that people will come to the negotiating table and negotiate. That's how we do it. And there have been studies on how Asians tend to be more consensual, more holistic. Some studies which show that a six-year-old American child will three times more refer to themselves as an individual. Uh, or if they see pictures of, uh, of fathers and mothers arguing, a Western child will tend to take sides immediately and assume that the mother or the father must be in the right or the wrong, whereas Asian children tend to perhaps feel that there may be a basis of, uh, of, re of reality for both sides. We've got to be careful about that, but the fact remains the United States is a Western country. And it, it is the Western partnership country. The US will continue to use this language. American internal politics will continue to a very large extent shape the language, if not actually shape the reality of the relationship. And China has to accept that. Uh, ultimately, and it's very big to have to accept that. Um, America is an Asian country, uh, whether you like it or not, um, by virtue of that historical accident of having two oceans uh, and of being able to escape from the 20th century and the Atlantic century into the Asian or the Pacific century. On the question of rebalancing, um, I think what I would say is this, that, that, that China is a, is, a, is a society or a country which is halfway, but not quite there yet, uh, as one of the great powers. The great power being defined as a global power. To be a great power today in the 21st century, you can't just be regional, you have to be global. Russia aspires to recapture its globe. Russia has a view on every part uh, of the world. It has navies in the Pacific, and it has navies in the Mediterranean, and it has navies in the Atlantic, and it has a navy in Archangel. It intends to be a global power with less than 7% of global GDP. That's rather a stretch, I think, for Russia to be as significant in the 21st century as it was in the 20th. But that is its aspiration. And one of the reasons why the West is very, uh, is not that critical of China in Syria is that the Chinese don't have much of a clue what's happening in Syria. The Russians know exactly what is happening in Syria. They have invested 40 years' worth in Syria. They have a base in Syria. They have cultivated the Baptist Party uh, and Assad. They are a Middle East power, and they see themselves as a Middle East power, and are not willing to be denied that role uh, by another case of mistaken or not so mistaken Western intervention. If China were, were willing to take on some global responsibilities, the United States could live with China much more easily, could see China as a global partner much more easily, and it's, that's rebalancing. But at the moment, China seems to me to be interested in getting back its position in East Asia. And that means pushing the United States out of East Asia, effectively back to Pearl Harbor. And that's something that the United States finds non-negotiable. It insists that it has a right to be an East Asian uh, power. And finally, on the question of, of defense, yes, it is quite true to say that if there were to be war between the United States and China today, we know who would win it. But on my historical analogy, though I don't wish to push that analogy too far, uh, China's where Germany was in 1890. Uh, and a lot is going to change uh, in the next 15 years. And remember one thing about this historical analogy, when Germany decided uh, to become a naval power and to enter into a naval arms race with the United Kingdom, the British response was to change the rules of engagement by inventing a battleship called the Dreadnought in 1906, which was so powerful uh, that it made all other battleships uh, largely irrelevant, which was most unfortunate for Britain, since Britain had more battleships than any other country. It's not going to be fought at sea, this confrontation. Uh, and it's not going to be about China catching up with the United States, which it has no chance of doing as a naval power in the foreseeable future. It's about the dreadnought. It's about changing the rules of engagement. And Americans are pretty convinced that there's not a great deal of, 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 of sunlight between themselves and China when it comes to cyberspace. But the Chinese indeed may, in fact, uh, be it in advance of the United States when it comes to penetrating cyberspace, not perhaps in terms of defending your position in cyberspace. We simply don't know. 
And when it comes to outer space, which means anti-satellite uh, weapon systems, the Americans are only a few years ahead uh, of China in this. They have a mobile anti-satellite system, which they tested a couple of years ago. The Chinese have a land-based one. Neither is allowed to militarize space by international law. No one has a clue what's actually up there. But if that arms race takes place in space, then it's not exactly going to start from a level playing field, but it's not going to start from the playing field of naval power which is why the Chinese will not be interested uh, in even pursuing that in terms of war. In terms of diplomacy, yes. In terms of uh, stopping the Americans putting two aircraft carriers off their coast and forcing them to back off on Taiwan, that's all already happened. The United States can't do what it did uh, a few years ago. So um, those are just a few comments that I wanted to make. Thank you very much, Professor Croker. Now I open the floor to all participants who would like to um, ask questions, either to our um, special guest, Professor Croker, or the three panelists. Uh, so it's quite in the reluctance period for Thailand because uh, both China and U.S. approaching Thailand, they often visit uh, not only the political leaders, is including the military leader, is involved on many projects that refused by or postponed by Thai government. Uh, so, like uh, ASEAN, have um, uh, idealistic goal, like to one one voice, one identity, but there's still a fraction. Uh, like from a non comments and comments there. What I want to analyze, like uh, from the bilateral relation and one voice, what do you mean, like one identity, one voice, one answer from ASEAN. But Thailand also facing the same problem because uh, according to the Parry Han case, Thailand want to solve the problem bilaterally with Cambodia. But Cambodia want to put it to ASEAN and solve it multilaterally. Okay, bring it back to the South China Sea controversy. So China also want to use its bilateral relation and talk with the climate state face to face without uh, put it into the multinational fora. So I would like to, to know like all of your comment, what from now on, what Thailand should do what the policy that Thai should implement to maintain the best position to balance these two power. Thank you very much. I'm Gan Lee Dong from uh, Siam Intelligence Unit. Um, um, maybe my question will direct to um, Professor Koger, <laughs> especially, um, because you mentioned a lot about possible conflict between um, China and the US. Um, if it Possible, if you can give um, an example of the um, of the conflict that may be happen in the future, um, what will the what will the conflict be um, unveiled, or we, what 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 the scenario will be happen between the, the two sides? What will the China will move? Um, what will the U.S. will cut the back? And what will ASEAN do? Thank you. Um. Maybe you want to start? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, there are two things that Thailand need to do. Since you're referring to uh, my presentations, I think uh, Thailand needs another rebalancing. I think Thailand's uh, foreign policy has been always, uh, you know, for the best part, side with the winner, and that uh, not choosing sides of a policy. And I think the the current situation uh, as a coordinator, Thailand must have a, a clear position. Of course, there are things that Thailand can do. There are things that Thailand cannot do. Thailand have to make it clear. We cannot uh, sit on the fence all the time. And I think this is one thing that Thailand has not yet been able to, uh, to do or try to uh, sort of uh, display. Uh, Thailand always always escape, making unclear position. I will give you, since you're from the military, Thailand take eight years uh, 
to adopt a position on PSI, Proliferation and Security Initiative. We agree in principle, and we agree in principle for eight years, and then we consult with relevant uh, concern uh, agency for eight years, so there's no decision made. That kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, unclear, obscure position can no longer serve Thai, or for that matter, uh, national interest. So I think from now on, given the uh, new uh, political landscape, it's very important, particularly Thailand, given a very close relation with China uh, and also United States as an ally, it's actually increased the value of Thai strategic linchpin for all these major power. So it depends on how we play the game. But so far, Thailand is content, which I argue is a wrong a move that is, we don't show any sign. We, we just uh, let follow the same policy of uh, ambiguity. I, I, I don't think uh, strategic ambiguity will work in this kind of uh, post-war, I mean, Cold War environment. Uh, we have to be clear and then uh, be able to, to work and then serve whatever interests that come on a a uh, case by case, and uh, we have to make ourselves clear that will strengthen. Because I think one of the problems here, the United States look at Thailand. Oh, you know, uh, we are in Chinese pocket, and then the Chinese look at uh, oh my goodness, Thailand is another um, American pro American boy because we are allies. So uh, nobody trusts us. But maybe from the Thai policy point of us, uh, Thai policy point of view, that is very good. For me, that is rather stupid. Um, you know, Thailand has to obviously avoid choosing between the United States and Thailand. That would make no sense whatsoever. But I think Thailand should have some kind of strategy, um, rather than being quiet, making clear to both sides that that. Thailand has very important economic ties with China, and uh, Thailand has, uh, you know, important political ties with China. But Thailand is also an ally of the United States and has very, very many common interests with the United States. Um, so you don't have to stay in the middle and be silent. Just make it clear to both sides that you have interests on both sides. We haven't mentioned uh, the domestic politics of, of Thailand. The the polarization, the, the divide, and uh, it's really a saga. Um, but uh, that has captured, to a degree, Thai foreign policy. There's no um, consensus, and there's no direction, uh, no clear direction in foreign policy. So that's part. Uh, that's partly the answer. That's why we're not uh, uh, more engaged or more effective uh, in, in in our role, Thailand. Uh, in the, um, the spat between the, um, the Philippines and uh, Vietnam and, and China in the past. It could have been, perhaps would have been Thailand that plays a role that Indonesia is playing now, trying to uh, take a leadership role and close ranks and um, regain momentum. On China and the US, you know, if you look at the, the stock of relationship with the US, Thai-US relations and, and the stock of the relationship is it's immense, it's very dense, uh, it's long-standing, especially in a military-to-military -military component. But the flow of uh, engagement and diplomacy and, and the flow of the relationship is closer to Beijing. Uh, now, that can, be, that can be played in different ways. Uh, it's actually good for Thailand. The Americans are afraid that if they push Thailand at all, if you look at the, the recent tax and visit to the U.S., right, the whole controversy, getting the visa to go to the United States, big protests, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, convulsions here. Tax and goes to Beijing all the time. I mean, on a regular basis. It goes to Japan, South Korea, not a problem. But why is it that with the U.S., you know, the former foreign minister said we should sever ties with the United States. Uh, so that tells you something about how we are uh, very grand jai towards the Chinese, much more grand jai, you know, very uh, somewhat beholden, uh, more beholden to the Chinese vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And I think that will be the, the trend. But however, it doesn't mean it's black or white. If Thailand plays it well, then the Americans will want to woo Thailand and it, Beijing will want to court uh, Thailand. 
uh, and that could maximize uh, Thailand's interest. But if it's uh, if it's not played right, then um, then you know Thailand will be uh, irrelevant. Right? It doesn't. I mean, th if there's a strategic ambiguity, it has to be well intended. It has to be thought out. It has to be designed. Uh, if it comes from uh, just uh, coincidence, then that could be a bad thing. Well, two parts to that question. I think one is the circumstances in which it might break out, and secondly, how it might be played out. We in the West are very influenced, of course, by uh, Sun Tzu and the art of war. In fact, uh, General Franks, who planned the invasion of Iraq, could, could cite the art of war practically by heart. And of those 100,000 books that were sent to American troops while they were preparing for the invasion, the art of war was one of the most popular. You will find two things that Sun Tzu actually says in the art of war amongst the many things he says, which I think are very distinctive to a Chinese idea of war insofar as there are cultural styles of war. That in itself is a debatable question. One is the, 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 the belief that uh, unlike the West where we've put a primary interest on reason and the ability of rationality to control war, one particular once it starts. Uh, Sun Tzu puts uh, the emphasis on the fact how quickly irrationality becomes dominant uh, once fighting begins. Therefore, always keep a war as limited as possible. Get it over with. Don't even fight it in the first place. The irrational element here will be nationalism and the way that Chinese nationalism pans out. It's very ugly, some Chinese nationalism. It's not to say that nationalism in the United States is not ugly as well, but it's new. It's a new factor. Uh, it is becoming politically significant. The days when a Chinese president or a Chinese party could remove uh, a, a major politician um, so quickly uh, and so easily as the major politician was removed a few months ago uh, will, will, will not be the same in a few years' time. There will be a military factor, a military audience, a military constituency to play with uh, and to play to. And that is, I think, uh, a key, how nationalism, whether the party can control nationalism. Uh, and if you want to see the ugliness of Chinese nationalism, read books like Unhappy China. It's, he's the, the guy who writes it is a Darwinist, the neo-Darwinist who believes in the survival of the fittest, who wanted war with the United States over Taiwan a few years ago, even though China might lose it, he said. That wasn't the point. The point was it was humiliating to have to back down. Uh, well, the point about politics is you manage humiliation. Uh, as best you can until you have another opportunity to assert yourself. The second factor, uh, that is the second factor, the, the importance of the military because Sun Tzu, even more than in a Western writer like Clausewitz who talks about war being the continuation of politics, there has never been Bonapartism as we call it in Chinese history. Even the warlords in the 1920s weren't in the military business, they were in the, their, their armies were political currency but they used for maneuvering for political power inside China. The idea is that the politicians have always control the military. There has been no tradition of militarism in China as there has in the West. There have been no Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, running uh, policy. That may change as the balance of power between the party and the military changes significantly in the military's interest. Already the party allows the military to spend whatever it wants to, to keep, to keep it happy. So watch that particular space. Three of the incidents, by the way, including the Highland incident, the incident with the test of the anti-satellite uh, uh, weapon system, and also the stealth uh, plane uh, that was launched while Robert Gates, the American Defense Secretary, was actually in China, uh, are, according to China watchers, were all done by the military without the foreign ministry knowing and to the embarrassment uh, of parts of the government. I'm not saying the entire government was unaware, but that's the kind of thing that might happen. An incident prompted by a military that feels the party is not standing up for China uh, where it counts. So that is my concern. How that war would uh, pan out, uh, three ways. One is the one that the United States is gaming for, because obviously both countries are gaming for war. You have to game for war. That's a part of deterrence, actually. That we all know each other's war plans. Uh, that's transparency, which is air-sea battle, which is basically is using this uh, phenomenal American uh, predominance at sea to actually have a, a boycott uh, in the South China Seas and down the whole China coast, declaring it a war zone, effectively, which will stop two-thirds of the uh, traffic going into it these 2,000 or so ships that go into Chinese ports every day, and that should only take five or six days, the US Navy feels, before China is forced to climb down. That's very far-fetched, I think, uh, in many respects, but it's how it's gained at the moment. 
The second is, 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 is through cyberspace, and that's to create what's called uh, a, a cybergeddon, uh, that is an Ameri a Pearl Harbor, but to do it properly this time. The problem with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was it was a tactical success but a strategic disaster. And the reason it was a strategic disaster is they failed to get the aircraft carriers, which were not in import that day. The idea is, can you do this in cyberspace? Can you actually switch off a country militarily long enough to impose a political defeat and force it to stand down or to step down or at least yield what it wants. Uh, within the defense community there are people who feel we do not have the technology to launch strategic cyber attacks or we can do a tactical pinpricks like the Russians in Estonia in 2007. Uh, without the ability to launch a strategic cyber attack I don't think that's going to happen. And the third is space. That's just to be able to take out American satellite systems, which make it impossible for the United States to fight war as it wishes to do so, which is the minimum risk to itself and the minimum risk to its personnel. So that's actually how the Chinese are, are, are go would deal, if they could, which they can't at the moment, with uh, air-sea battle strategy. Switch off the satellites, because without that you just can't coordinate a military operation at the moment. So those are the three things. Uh, as for the nuclear option, well, there's a, a, an Australian academic called Harry White who has written about this at great length. Uh, he's uh, postulated an incident at sea which leads to a nuclear, tactical nuclear attack on the American base in Guam with no American retaliation because the United States will not want to go to the next level and will accept the humiliation and the defeat. Uh, this does not go down at all well, which is why Harry White was boycotted at the American Embassy Party in Sydney, uh, in Canberra rather, when uh, Robert Gates paid a visit. Gates had his name struck off the list because it's absolutely essential to the United States for the deterrence to be believed that if you go nuclear, we will respond in kind. We won't over-respond, but we will respond. There will be a nuclear response somewhere. So that is American doctrine. Uh, if, you, if you say publicly you're not going to, or it's unlikely, then the whole of this deterrence theory comes unraveled or unstuck. But that would be really taking it to the point of the kind of Cuban Missile Crisis in, in 1962. And you have to remember one thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was the time when the American military was out of control. Uh, and where those people who were advising the president were uh, the kind of people who would have no career in the US military today, the people that Eisenhower was frightened of in his last year as president, and that John F. Kennedy had every reason to be frightened of. They'd become too powerful for the constitutional good of the country. Uh, anyway, we got beyond that stage. There'll be a stage where the Chinese military may get to that point. Uh, we've got to get over that point. But I think that point will be reached at some point on the basis of my reading of history. But uh, as I keep saying, reading of history doesn't explain everything. You can't put predictions, make predictions purely on a reading of history. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions from the floor? Yes, please. My name is Ken Jimbo. I'm currently a visiting fellow at Tamasat University, uh, but originally from Keio University uh, in Japan. Um, I'd like to come back to South China Sea uh, debate. Uh, as uh, Professor Titinan uh, mentioned, that what's going to happen in this November uh, will be quite critical, not only for ASEAN, but also for non ASEAN state, especially uh, for uh, Japan and, and South Korea. As you know, that this might be the first time that uh, since 2002, whether China uh, will abide by uh, its negotiation on the rule-based uh, maritime security uh, order uh, with ASEAN. And China might use uh, this as a prototype to, for the next round negotiation with Japan and Korea uh, on the East China issue uh, as well, so that uh, it might be the interest uh, all of the non-ASEAN uh, member uh, as well. Uh, from that perspective, that uh, what I found um, as a kind of six points agreement uh, made by the ASEAN in July uh, would frankly say it doesn't really simply uh, reflect the reality of the, what the ASEAN truly uh, would like to see as a rule-based uh, maritime uh, security order. And I would like to ask that uh, what would be the practical uh, possibility of what's going to happen uh, in November and how much would those, uh, you know, the rule-based um, legally binding code of conduct uh, would have a possible uh, future. Would that entail with uh, 
more than like a principal agreement was a six uh, six points agreement or, or that include that uh, any kind of like a crisis management mechanism between ASEAN and China uh, fishery agreements or any new agreements with the, the sharing of the or the investigation of the resources in the South China Sea and I would like to see those uh, 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 you know the possibility of the um, views of the speakers um, and, and if those efforts ended up in 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 failure uh, uh, and what would be the next round strategy of ASEAN uh, of engaging China into this conflict and my my next final question is that um, it is the role of Japan if I may um, Japan has been re-engaging ASEAN uh, in a more I would say uh, regional security oriented manner uh, we have been uh, spending ODA in uh, a lot of infrastructure projects which is related to more to the security and we are also uh, selling uh, the petrol vessels to Philippines and maybe possibly to Vietnam and, and also to Malaysia in the belief that, that the balance of power is this, uh, you know, uh, currently rapidly destabilizing and uh, I think it's our belief that the providing those capacity building uh, effort would uh, bring those uh, nations to have a more like a negotiating power vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Would you see this kind of like a Japanese uh, engagement as a matter of the destabilizing the ASEAN unity or uh, it might be helping uh, the ASEAN position towards China? Thank you very much. Um, seems to be uh, running out of time. I think this would be the last question. So may I invite um, Dr. Tijinan to respond to the question first? Of course, there is shuttle diplomacy, lots of uh, behind the scenes maneuvers. I do think that given what happened in July, uh, that has set some parameters. I, I don't think that the um, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen, uh, the Cambodian uh, Foreign Minister and, and their team are going to reverse position suddenly. I think that they have set some parameters uh, and does not seem to be uh, Minister Marty is trying to, to um, lead uh, uh, efforts to, uh, to mend uh, the differences but it doesn't seem to, to be that effective so far. So I suspect that uh, they will kind of buy some time. Uh, there will be some kind of a uh, if there's a joint position, it will be a diluted one, and then uh, they will buy time uh, to next year, and then they'll have to buy more time. Uh, so this is something that I think they will not uh, address squarely uh, based on the ASEAN centrality unity, uh, because China has been uh, very clear, and uh, Cambodia has also been very clear that it's uh, beholden to, to, uh, to Beijing. On Japan, ODA, yes, Japan has invested a lot, and I don't think that, uh, well, Japan, I think, feels short change for what it has put in in the region, not just uh, uh, recently, but uh, for decades. Uh, and now, the, you know, China has stolen the, sh the, the thunder in some ways, but even though China has not invested as much for as long as Japan. Uh, selling patrol vessels uh, to uh, Vietnam and Philippines I don't think uh, would undermine ASEAN unity. I think it would in fact uh, uh, promote some uh, sort of a, a more balanced uh, uh, framework in, in the region as long as it's not, uh, um, it does not appear uh, to be too intentional. It does not appear to be intentional uh, to try to promote Philippine and Vietnamese interests at the expense of China, uh, then I think it would be uh, it would be beneficial to 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 ASEAN. Well, I, I have two points. Uh, ASEAN uh, Japan relations are very peculiar one. I think Japan has. Uh, uh, maintain a wrong position all along, playing the second fiddle to the United States, even though for the past 40 years, uh, uh, Japan and ASEAN will celebrate 40 anniversaries uh, next year. Uh, Japan could do a lot more because it's focused on economic oriented. Now, uh, I noticed that uh, of late, Japan want to re uh, people's, uh, repositioning itself in the overall scheme of cooperation with ASEAN which more security oriented. I think uh, this will be welcome because uh, for years and years uh, there is a taboo not to talk about uh, Japan uh, higher defense profile because it brought back the kind of uh, 
uh, bad memory of, of the, the past. Now that I think uh, Japan has overcome that kind of uh, monstrous image and want to move ahead. So uh, it would not be a surprise that Japan relations uh, with ASEAN in the future will have more security dimension. I, I remember in early years of uh, Kaifu, Tochiki Kaifu, Kaifu has proposed uh, several ideas related to mar maritime cooperation with Thailand. It was a little bit premature and raised uh, anti-Japanese uh, at that time. I think similar uh, proposal with less, uh, with uh, focus or uh, but more broader applicable to other ASEAN country might increase confidence in this matter so uh, overall I think ASEAN uh, would welcome uh, a much more uh, uh, security uh, oriented particularly you mentioned capacity building the word capacity building is a very tricky one and I think uh, it depends on what uh, particular aspect you have to remember that all ASEAN country have uh, close cooperation and separate cooperation with China, including defense cooperation, uh, Japan, even though it has a very close uh, cooperation with ASEAN as a whole, but individually, the uh, comprehensiveness is much less than uh, the Chinese. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all the questions and uh, participation um, in this program. In the morning, Professor Quoker has formulated um, a lot of questions, and our three speakers have provided insightful presentation on the roles of ASEAN, China, and the US in the region and in South China Sea conflict. Um, I'm not sure if um, you have more, uh, you have questions or you have answers to questions before coming here, but I am sure that we have a lot more questions to think over after we leave the room. Thank you very much.